three groups before I go forward. One is the choir that was absolutely beautiful. It always is. The second is the greeters that we have on Sunday morning worship. Those people have been working their tails off for the last several months, more than years now, and they're doing a wonderful job. In the last two weeks especially, they have been just really, really blowing and going. And the third is uh, friendly faces. Uh, when I was recovering from certain, I guess a fourth group would be the prayer shawl ministry. Um, I got, you know, when I was recovering from surgery, I got prayer shawl and I got cards and it was just absolutely wonderful. Now, I had one more, oh yes, one more thing. If you're a visitor here today, or if you need to, um, I usually don't do the announcements, sorry. Uh, the, if you need to update your, your information, there is a half sheet page in there, church welcome card. If you'll fill that out and uh, get that to me at the end of the service, we will make sure, uh, A, if you remember your data is correctly entered to the database. If you're a visitor, I'll be calling you to see how you're doing and check in with you. Also, on the back of that is a prayer concern card. If you need to fill that out, please do and get it to me at the end of the service. I want you to open your Bibles to John 9, 1. John 9, 1. You can cheat and look on the front of the bulletin if you want to, but... Go for it. Get your Bibles out. Bring your Bibles to church. The scripture today records a time when Jesus, Jesus had just finished uh, he had a series of debates with the thin arguments of the Pharisees. And they were, there was even a point in there where they were picking up stones, excuse me, stones to stone him. He slips away, as the scripture says. His disciples are with him and they head south. And that brings us to John 9 1. As he went along, he saw a man blind from birth. That is, as Jesus went along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Neither, said Jesus, this man nor his parents sinned. But this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. As long as it is day, we must do the works of him who sent me. Night is coming. When no one can work, while I am in the world, I am the light of the world. And after saying this, he spit on the ground, made some mud with the saliva, and put it on the man's eyes. Go, he told him, wash in the pool of Siloam, which means sent. So the man went and washed, and he came home seeing. This is the word of God for the people of God, and all God's people said, the Sunday after I turned 40, I was getting dressed. And how can I say this? My pants would not fasten. <laughs> so I did what any self-respecting preacher would do. I laid down on the bed. I sucked my gut in as hard as I could and got those suckers fastened and then stood up and I heard a pop. <laughs> now the week before they fit, when I was 39, uh, this, this Sunday they did not fit. A few days later, a friend of mine was, uh, who was noticeably slimmer uh, than she had been in college, uh, she said that she had, uh, I asked her how she had done that, and she said she had an app on her smartphone called Couch to 5K. Yes, shameless plug. And it was, a, it was a running program or a running regimen that took you from being a couch potato to someone who could run a 5K in nine weeks' time. So I dusted off a pair of extremely cheap and extremely old running shoes, and I got started. Now, I had never been athletic. Uh, the high point of my athletic career was sixth grade when I accidentally got a home run in uh, kickball, um, but when it was over, when this program was over, I could run three 5Ks in a week, which I had never done before. Now exercise and fitness are extremely important things. Um, your body is a temple. Fitness is a big industry these days. People spend hours uh, pursuing it. They spend billions pursuing it. But how often do we ignore the other kind of fitness? Spiritual fitness, 
being fit for the Holy Spirit. Um, I have found that I and too many others take the Holy Spirit for granted. We think that the Holy Spirit is warm religious fuzzies. Um, the Holy Spirit, you know, is a bird that flits around landing on people's head and things like that. Um, I hope that we can learn here today that the Holy Spirit is not just warm religious fuzzies. They might be the Holy Spirit, but the problem is, is they could also just be good feelings or some zing of nostalgia or something like that. The Holy Spirit is also not a bird. Uh, he is gentle like a dove, but the Holy Spirit is something very significant. He is a co-equal part of the Trinity. He's equal to God the Father and God the Son. And all that is nothing special, theologically speaking. Uh, this is absolutely nothing special, theologically speaking. This is not isolated to one tribe of Christianity to think this way. Uh, this is true from Catholicism to Methodism to non-denominational whatever. The Holy Spirit is a co-equal part of the Trinity. Now, we live in the age of the Holy Spirit, it is said. Jesus, God the Son, has ascended to heaven at the right hand of God the Father, as the Scripture in the Apostles' Creed reminds us. And the Holy Spirit came on the first Pentecost, and He is still here today. He is poured out on all flesh. There is a Pentecost, I don't know if you know this or not, there is a Pentecost-like event everywhere or somewhere on the earth, not everywhere, but I wish everywhere, but somewhere on the earth every single day. He is indeed still poured out on all flesh, like Joel 2 said. The question is, is how do we receive him? Jesus tells us to ask. Now, I don't know if you noticed last week's scripture, but the apostles were standing before the Sanhedrin. And they said to them this curious phrase, we are witnesses of, of those things about Jesus. And also is the Holy Spirit a witness of it, whom God has given to those who obey him. The Holy Spirit is received by asking, yes, he is received and given by the grace of God. But I want to suggest to you today, that the scripture teaches that he is kept by obedience. Paul talks about the Holy Spirit in Romans 8, 9. You, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but you are in the realm of the Spirit. If indeed the Spirit of God lives in you, and if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. Isaiah 63, he says this, that we, when we rebel against God, it grieves the Holy Spirit. And he actually says this, he actually says that the Holy Spirit becomes our enemy, which is a very intense kind of phrase. God says this in Leviticus 20, be holy for I am holy. And there's the scripture that always zings me. This is in 1 Corinthians. Paul says this, do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. We fundamentally cannot have connection, relationship, fellowship with a holy God and walk through life in an unholy fashion. Now, how can we become more spiritually fit for the Holy Spirit? We'll be looking at the parts of the body for the next several weeks uh, don't worry, I'm going to avoid certain body parts like the pancreas and uh, other things, but we'll, uh, we'll go forward. First is your eyes. How can your eyes be made fit for the Holy Spirit? Well, just think about it for a second. Where do your eyes go? Where do your eyes go? What has your eyes? What possesses your eyes? Now, obviously, several things possess your eyes. Your work. Uh, but where do you put your eyes are precious where do you place them what do you put before them because what you put before them will enter you and influence your spirit you know in the scripture today the man was healed of physical blindness and later on in the scripture I didn't read this part to you but he, he went before the Pharisees now talk about a bunch that needed healing from spiritual blindness and that's the struggle that most people, I think, they actually have. It's not just that you're putting 
unclean things before your eyes. People actually struggle with spiritual blindness. And there are three areas that I find as a pastor that people generally struggle with. Naturally, there's a lot more, but generally here they are. Blindness in believing, blindness in rebellion, and blindness, blindness in bitterness. And I've met a lot of people, this first part, the believing part, I've met a lot of people who have Christian, who have questions about the Christian faith. Sometimes they're inside of it, a lot of times they're outside of it. They look, those that are outside obviously look in from the outside. They look at Christianity and they look at Christians and all they see is imperfection. All they see is bad practice. All they see is some kind of error. And they say, ah, well, Christianity is too difficult. Or they say that Christianity doesn't make any sense. Uh, it can't be done. You're all a bunch of hypocrites, blah, 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 blah. Let me tell you a story about this. I have some reason to witness introductory karate classes recently. Um, I don't practice it myself. I watch the students. They are five to nine years old. And when starting out, I'm not just randomly there watching five to nine year olds, by the way. My daughter's there, if you don't know. Um, when they started out, <coughs> they couldn't kick worth a flip. I mean, they were just, they were just, they were bad, okay? Um, they didn't know a forward kick from a roundhouse kick. They couldn't get it done. They couldn't get their foot, you know, 15 degrees off the ground, let alone 75 or 80 or hours. But, but they didn't know what they were doing. Now, I'm sitting here watching this. And, you know, in 1983, I took Tang Soo Do at the YMCA in Florence, Alabama. So obviously, and I got the first degree white belt, so obviously I know what I'm talking about. And I look at these kids and I say, you know, I could do that. In fact, I could do it better, you know, because I've been watching them. Man, I'm a grown-up. You know, I could just do this better. I could teach these kids how to do this. This is the point where Miss Ashley, the instructor, turns to the parents and says, all right, parents, come out on the floor. <laughs> Not kidding. <sighs> and... Let's just say that I was not as good as Finn with the lightsaber in Force Awakens, okay? You know, 1983 was a long time ago, and I am not a Jedi. Um, why could I not do it? Why could an eight-year-old, my eight-year-old, stand next to me and do it better? Practice. The kid now plays by practicing her kicks and her punches and her kata forms. You remember that maxim we learn by doing? What makes you think Christianity is any different? Sometimes I want to say to these folks that are so critical of Christianity, both from the inside and the out, it's not that Christianity has been tried and, and found impossible. It's been tried and found difficult and people went out. And you may say, well, wait, Trav, you're talking about believing and not doing. Yes, because in Christianity, they are the same. St. Augustine, who was a, a vowed pagan and an attorney, not to say that the attorneys are pagans, um, but he, he was a pagan uh, before he was converted to Christianity. He, also, he was a really bad pagan. He was a really mediocre pagan at that. Uh, he was converted to Christ in his early 30s, by, mainly by the prayers of his mother and the intervention of God. But he said this after he became a Christian, a well-respected theologian. He said, do not seek to understand that you may believe, but believe that you may understand. In other words, you have to practice Christianity before you declare it a failure and a waste of time. You, can, you have to look at it in its totality and everything it says. You can't go and pick and choose like you're going to the grocery store. You cannot, as it were, sample the dish and sneer and offer an opinion as if you are the judge of all. You must learn how to cook. Then and only then can you speak with authority. And I found that the people who actually do that are the ones who really become Christians. And then as you practice, you will see the scales fall from your eyes and you will become fit for the Holy Spirit. Because spiritual blindness goes away. The other thing is rebellion. We struggle with rebellion. I definitely struggle with rebellion. We are within the faith. We are practicing it. And then we see something that we want. Some bobble or some activity or something. And we can crack up these really holy sounding, wonderful reasons 
to do it, but basically the problem is we want it, my precious. <laughs> Spiritual rebellion is the insistence upon our own will over and against the will of God. The more we rebel, the more, well, the less we are able to see. Paul says this in Romans, the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all godlessness and wickedness of, of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him, but their thinking became futile and their few foolish hearts were darkened. And the spiral begins. Rebellion leads to a distance in the relationship with God, no worship, no thanksgiving which leads to intellectual confusion, which leads to darkness, which leads to blindness. And all because we want it, my precious. And our model here is the Lord. What did he pray in Gethsemane? Now, I know he's Jesus. He has sort of advantages over us. But what did he pray? If he's our model, what did he pray? He prayed, not my will, but thy will. That's the King James Version because it sounds better than that other stuff. The third thing is bitterness. 1 John 2, 9 says this, anyone who claims to be in the light but hates his brother is still in the darkness, but whoever hates his brother is in the darkness and walks around in the darkness, and he does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded him. Have you ever let bitterness build up? I mean, I have. Bitterness build up. Have you ever walked around in darkness and bitterness for the absolutely most holy reason possible, or even a set of holy reasons? Maybe bring a few other people into the fold of the darkness by gossip. That's why gossip is so evil, because it breeds darkness and hate. Not just because it's gossip in itself, but because of what it creates. Now, it is normal to feel resentment and anger, but letting it fester creates a fever that eventually thinks, that, that eventually you like it because it keeps you warm. But there's nothing that keeps you warm so much as the fire of the Holy Spirit and the fever of bitterness will never, ever be a substitute for that. So let go of bitterness. The other part of the body is the ears. How can the ears be made fit for the Holy Spirit? Well, what do you put in front of them? What do you put in front of them? What do you let them absorb? You know, Jesus ran around quite a bit saying, if anyone has ears, let him hear. And I'm sure there were deaf people in the audience. So he must have meant something different other than physical healing. You know, I watch my garden a lot, and I watch the soil. And sometimes I'll, I'll take an umbrella out and watch the rain fall down on the soil. Now, some soils receive the water. You know, they pulls it down, sucks it in, it goes into a little cavity inside the soil, or it is absorbed in some absorbent material in there. Who knows why? Other waters, um, the water just flows right through and goes on. And other water, it just doesn't even penetrate the top. It just sort of goes off somewhere. And before you know it, those last two soils are dry and thirsty again. And the Lord speaks his word to the world. There are at least two sources. One is the written scripture, and the other is a human being in whom the word dwells or by the Holy Spirit. And if you want to hear the word of God, you have to listen to it actively. You can't just sort of come in here and get your shot of groovy Jesus juice and go out. I mean, over time that will, that will help you, you know, but it, it will do things for you being in the presence of God and listening to the word of God read and proclaimed. But there's nothing that is a substitute for attending to the study of the word of God yourself, especially in a group. Whoever has ears, let him hear. That we must obey, that we must practice and that our minds must be right, and that we must believe even more. And here's the hard part. Only then will our wills finally yield, and that is the hard part. I mean, have you ever really sat down and thought about this? This is one of the Sundays after Easter, so I can go on. Um, your will must yield. 
to the will of God. That is the thing that terrifies me sometimes because I don't know if I'm ready to yield to his will. But, you know, I'm not the oldest rat in the bar, and I tell you, but I've learned some things along the way that when it doesn't matter if I am ready because he is ready. And our wills must yield to the will of God to be truly fit for the Holy Spirit. Now, maybe you're not fit for the Holy Spirit. Maybe you're just, I don't know, you look nice, but you're like secretly, completely blind and deaf spiritually. And the only thing that can catch you is if the hand of God comes down and bonks you on the forehead. I mean, you may have eaten too much at the table of the world and you can't fasten your pants. Or you may not have feasted at the table of the Lord in a long time and you're so spiritually ragged that your clothes are hanging off your spiritual bones. Look, you are not a Christian by family or nationality or tradition. God has absolutely no grandchildren, just children. You have to be born again. And you are not a Christian, you are a Christian, excuse me, by that birth, by that faith, by that public confession. I mean, we don't just say the, Lord, the Apostles' Creed because it's cute. Every single week we come together again and publicly confess that because it's true, because it changes us. And that it makes us followers of Jesus Christ in that changing. You are a Christian by faith, by birth, by public, by spiritual birth, by public confession, by word and deed. And you have a decision to make. Not just once and for all, although in a way you do, but basically every moment of every day. You have a decision to make. Now Jesus said to this man, this wonderful man who gave brilliant, brilliant testimony. I, I, one of the reasons I want to go to heaven is, well, there's a lot of reasons, but I really would like to meet this guy. He had to have been a really, he, some of the best lines in scripture come out of this blind man's mouth. But Jesus said to him, he said, go and wash in the pool of Siloam. Only when the man obeyed was he healed? Now think about that for a minute. I wish God would just give it to me. I just wish I could understand. I just wish this, I just wish. Only when the man obeyed was he healed. Now if it's spiritual healing that you want, if you want a new beginning, if you want more to this life, you have to respond and obey the call of Jesus Christ on your life. So the question is, maybe for the first time, maybe, not, not maybe for the first time, maybe for the first time, but also every moment of every day, what is your decision? Is it spiritual blindness and spiritual deafness because it's easier to be ignorant and blind and deaf and not know what's going on? Or is your response obedience? You know, something that the world mocks as foolish is obedience. Our obedience will dictate our spiritual sight. I'm getting freaked out now because I'm almost to bifocal stage. Okay? Spiritually, you don't need glasses. You need healing. And to obtain that spiritual healing, you need obedience. He wants us, most of all, to trust Him in this. So what is your decision? Now, whatever you do, I, I know I'm really intense. I've been criticized my whole life. You're just too intense, Trevor. <laughs> but when that decision comes, you make it with joy. Not because, yes, Lord, I want to be obedient. It's, yes, Lord, I want to see. I want to hear, I want to know, I want the full force of the relationship, I want the full fire of the Holy Spirit. Make the decision with joy. If you want to be fit for the Holy Spirit, think about it that way. Sight, hearing in ways that the world doesn't understand, and joy. May we pray. Heavenly Father, we ask you, Holy Spirit, please come now and fill us that we can be obedient and call, or excuse me, answer your call. 
We don't want to do this lightly, but we also don't want to do this heavily with a bunch of draggy things. The world is far too full of these hyper-intense, drugged-down, burdened, religious -y people. We want to be your people, light of heart, rejoicing in our sight, rejoicing in our hearing, rejoicing in the hands that we have that can do things, the feet that can take us along with you. We want to be your temples where your Holy Spirit can find peace and rest and joy himself and not grief. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you. It's in Jesus' name. Amen.